Good morning, everyone. I am Caleb. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm delighted that we can worship together here on this Trinity Sunday, uh, one of the days in the life of the church where we remember that we worship a triune God. A couple exciting things going on in the life of our church. Uh, next week, if you are fully vaccinated, you can leave this in your car. Woohoo! Yay! Um, and to celebrate, uh, after church, we're going to have a cookout. Um, so make sure you bring a friend, and we will uh, we'll be eating all sorts of delicious, scrumptious things coming from the grill and the smoker and um, the Frito-Lay company. So it'll be good. Uh, make sure you plan on staying for a cookout tomorrow, or not tomorrow, next week after church. Starting next uh, Tuesday night, we're going to have a pastor Bible study starting up, um, so make sure you come out. Uh, we'll probably be eating food beforehand, like 6, 6.30ish, but the Bible study will start at 7 um, here at Trinity. We are starting up a, a new sermon series called Asking for a Friend, um, and you have the opportunity to help shape what the content will be around. Um, so we've been in this, this year uh, that has brought a lot of things into question, um, which has led us to, to have lots of questions. Um, so if you want to share one of those questions, uh, please write it on the back of your connection card, um, asking for a friend, ask your question, and um, it may just inform uh, some of what we talk about this summer. Uh, the connection card, please make sure you fill it out. It's one of the ways we stay connected to, to one another. If it is your first time here, please make sure you indicate which of our ministry partners um, you would like uh, a donation to go to in your honor. Uh, we are so glad that God has brought you here so that we can worship together. Um, and I invite you to, to, to do that, and we will be, we'll be in, that, in this together. We've been uh, memorizing scripture together as a church um, and this week is no different. We have a new scripture verse. It says it comes on the screen. Let's, let's, uh, let's recite it together. This comes from Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 11. And Luke writes, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's make sure we memorize it this week as we, as we, uh, as we plant the word of God deep in our hearts. It, it helps us to, to live in a way that honors and pleases God. It helps us to live in a, a life that is satisfying and full of joy. Uh, so I encourage you to, to memorize the scripture this week. And for those who have been memorizing scripture, I want to hear the stories of how um, having this scripture memorized has made a difference in your life. Um, and we will be fe featuring those stories coming up later. We have been uh, in a season where God has continued to answer our prayers in incredible ways. Um, so if you would, please rise and let's say our breakthrough prayer together. Break through, Lord. Take the hard and barren soil of our hearts and cultivate it so we might grow and bear the fruit of your kingdom. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our first hymn together this morning.
So this spring, we've been working our way through the Apostles' Creed and through um, the systematic theology of the Christian faith. Uh, and today we find ourselves talking about sacraments, um, baptism and communion and these, these means of grace that God uses in our lives to draw us near to him. So our first text today comes from Luke chapter 3. And in Luke chapter 3 we read, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysantius Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. And John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. And John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. And even tax collectors came to be that baptized. Teacher, they said, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. And then soldiers asked him, and what should we do? And he replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And the people were waiting expectantly, and all were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. But then John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, and the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Ah, we are going through 22, good. In my head, I'm like, we're stopping at 18, but I'm like, why are we stopping at 18? We should go through 22. So, but when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. And when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So a little key to understanding the Bible as we read it. When lots of different chronological markers are stacked on top of each other, that's an indication that what's coming is really important. Really important. So here at the, at the beginning of, of chapter 3, uh, Luke uses four different chronological markers to say when this is happening. He wants us to really focus in and recognize the importance of this moment where John the Baptist is baptizing for the forgiveness of sins in the Jordan. This is a, a, a big deal. It is a big sign of the coming kingdom. That John has come and he is baptizing is, a, is foreshadowing of the coming Messiah. 
that the paths are being made straight, that a way is being cut in the wilderness for the Lord to come. And John is baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus comes to be baptized. Now, at this point, it would be reasonable to ask the question, well, if John is baptizing for the forgiveness of sins, why is Jesus going to be baptized? Because Jesus hasn't sinned. Why would he need the baptism that John is providing? When I was, um, when I was in, I worked at a golf course. Um, we did turf. So, you know, mowing rough, breaking bunkers, you know, cutting new pins. Um, and one of the things I, I remember distinctly is that in our um, turf barn, there was a disgusting bathroom. It was gross, right? Like, like you can imagine, the only people who used this bathroom were covered in golf course chemicals and, you know, grass and sand, and I mean, it, was, it was nasty in there. And once a week, our boss would clean this nasty, gross bathroom. And he wouldn't let any of the rest of us clean it. He cleaned the bathroom. Now, he didn't have to. Right? I mean, he's the head greenskeeper. He very easily could have been like, hey, Caleb, you're at the bottom of the totem pole. Here's your toothbrush. But one of the ways he led us and he identified with us and he, he, he invited us into the community of keeping the golf course in pristine condition was by taking the grossest job. Jesus, in being baptized by John, he is identifying with us. I mean, this is, this is part of why as Christians, we talk about baptism as being um, probably most importantly a invitation into the family of faith. Like the reason why we baptize infants is because unlike the baptism of John where someone recognizes their sin and is baptized, we see baptism as welcoming someone into the family of faith. And that's something that, that, that for us, we believe we should even welcome little tiny infants into the family. And it's a beautiful picture of God's love for us. Um, if, if you've ever been here on a Sunday where we've baptized a baby, I've told you this, and I'm going to tell it to you again because it is true and it is beautiful. There is no more beautiful picture of God's love for us than the baptism of an infant. Because infants have zero economic value. Even with Biden bucks coming in and us getting tax credits for children for the next six months, infants still have a negative economic value. Because they can't make any money, they can't do any chores, they pretty much eat and sleep and make messes and cry. They are wholly selfish. Yet, we love them. We love them so much that we invite them into the family of faith. And that is, that is such a beautiful picture of God's love for us that when we have absolutely nothing to offer God, nothing, that his love comes first. That God invites us into his love, into his family, into the kingdom So Jesus, here in Luke 3, he is being baptized so as a way to identify with us and identify in this, this, this human condition that we are born into.
And as he is baptized, we see that the Father and the Holy Spirit reveal the identity of the Son. Here on Trinity Sunday, that's especially important, that when we talk about who God is, that here at the baptism of Jesus, we see in its most clear form the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit existing as three separate persons. As heaven opens up, the Holy Spirit descends down like a dove, the Father says, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased, and Jesus is the Son. But it's here in the center of this passage that I think we see something really interesting happening. In verse 10, the crowd who's coming to be baptized is asking John, what does repentance look like? We recognize our sinfulness. We, are, we want to repent. We want to change our ways. We want to turn from doing evil and live into the paths that God has created for us. What does repentance look like? John, what should we do then? And the first thing he talks about is generosity. That repentance looks like recognizing that all of that scarcity activity that I've been doing to hoard up things is unnecessary. It's recognizing that God truly can provide for all my needs and I don't need to to hoard things, but I can freely give them away to those who are in need. And then Luke writes that the tax collectors ask, and they say, what does it look like to repent? And and here I find it fascinating that John doesn't tell them, well, first thing, stop being a tax collector. Because for most of the Jews, tax collectors, by the very nature of their occupation, were traitors. Like, even if they were not taking advantage and charging people more than they should have, like, by the very nature of being a tax collector in the first century, you were a traitor. Because you know who you worked for? Those no-good Romans who were occupying our country. They're oppressing us. And you're working for them. You're the worst. The worst And what does John say? Instead of saying, you know, stop being a tax collector, which is what I would would expect him to say, he says, the job that you're in, the role you're doing, do it with integrity. Don't take advantage of people. And then a soldier comes to be comes to be baptized. And, I mean, you see this this progression from, you know, the crowds say, what does repentance look like? And then those no good, terrible tax collectors say, what does repentance look like? And then finally, the oppressor themselves, a Roman soldier, is there to be baptized and asked, what does it look like to repent? What does it look like to live a life that is honoring to God. And John says, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. He doesn't say, well, first things first, go back to Rome. Get out of here. Let us do our own thing. He says, no, Do your job with integrity. 
Don't take advantage of the influence and the power that you have to oppress those who are under your care. I think John is exposing a feature of the kingdom that is sometimes lost on us. That in the kingdom, whether we are teachers or nurses or pastors or finance people or engineers or professional dog walkers. I mean, like, whatever job we have is irrelevant. Our expectation as Christians is to do what we do with integrity. To do it in a Christian way. That there are no occupations that are inherently noble but that we have the opportunity to live with integrity and nobility in wherever we find ourselves. Which is incredibly countercultural. Because it's, it's so easy for us to be like, oh, this is a good person occupation and this is a bad person occupation. Right? Only good people teach kindergarten. Only bad people are lawyers for pharmacy companies. Right? Like, this is, this is the way we are taught to think about it. But John is calling this entirely into question. He says, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works. You don't get a pass just because you're teaching kindergarten. You, you especially don't get a pass to go and do whatever you want to if you're in one of these jobs that we find to be ignoble. But no, the call of Christ on our lives is no matter where we are, no matter what we are doing, we are to act with integrity. We are to act generously. We are to act kindly with humility. Because even being a child of Abraham doesn't mean that we are destined for salvation. John is, is, is taking Ju the Jewish thought of the time and turning it on its head. It's not about where you came from, who you're connected to, what you do. It's about how you do it. Are we choosing integrity or are we just going with the flow? Are we doing hard things that God calls us to do, or are we simply doing what's expected of us? When, when we come together to celebrate a sacrament, these questions are brought to us once again. In our baptismal uh, vows, we say that we will take advantage of the power that Jesus gives us to, to oppose oppression in all its forms. To live a life that is pleasing to God. And we can do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that descends upon Jesus at his baptism fills us in our baptism to live lives pleasing to God. It is not something that we manufacture on our own, but it is a gift that we are given by virtue of being part of the family of God. If you would, please rise and let's sing our next...
Him together, sweet hour of prayer. The sacraments are two means of grace that we celebrate together as a church, but there are other means of grace that we use to connect with God. We, we use scripture reading and memorization, we serve our neighbors, and prayer is another primary form of a means of grace. So we have some opportunities to grow in our practices of prayer. First. The United Methodist Women have created 120 prayer squares. These squares come partially from leftover material from the time that they made um, blankets for missions. So they took the corners of those blankets, those blankets they were sending to people in need, and they turned them into these beautiful prayer squares, and then they worked to create some others. And these squares are available for you to take with you today they're out at the counter, the missions counter, where we used to have things like sign-up sheets and all of that. Um, so you can pick one of those up. And there are several ways you can use these squares. You can pray over the square for a person and give that prayer square to them. When you are visiting someone, you can take that square with you. And as you're there visiting, when you leave in prayer, um, you can hold that while you pray and give that to them as a reminder of the presence of God in their lives. Um, if you want to grab a square today, I would love to see all of you take one with you. If you need ideas on how to use those, Chris was talking to me before the service today and had so many good ideas for how they could be used. Chris, could you wave to everyone? A little higher so they can see. Yeah, right there, okay. So um, just see Chris, take one of those prayer squares um, and use that as a blessing, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. Also, if you don't have a regular time of prayer every day, 
and you would love one, or you have a time set aside for prayer, and like me, there are days where, you know, you're running a little behind, and unfortunately that gets cut. I'm guilty. Um, I am starting a prayer class this Thursday. We will meet at 7 p.m. here at the church in the gathering space, and we're going to use the Living Workbook of Prayer by Maxie Dunham. It's a great book, and it'll give you an opportunity to build a daily prayer practice and to meet with other people who are doing that for accountability and to share what God is doing in your life through prayer. So if you are free on Thursday nights, uh, I invite you to join us starting this Thursday. We will meet for seven weeks. Usually meetings will last about an hour and a half, but that first meeting will just be about 45 minutes. So I invite you to come. If you have questions about that, see me after the service. And now will you go with me before the Lord in prayer? Loving Father, we thank you for this day and for this time that we have together to reflect upon your word, to sing your praise, to celebrate the sacrifice of Christ and receive your grace anew through the sacrament of communion. Father, there are those of us here who come with burdens, who have come with worry for our friends, for family members, for those who are ill, for those who are suffering. Lord, give us the ability to take those things and lay them at your feet. As people come to mind throughout the day who are in need of your love and mercy and grace, gently remind us to bring them to you, Lord. Father, some of us come carrying guilt guilt for doing things that we know we shouldn't have done or not doing things we should have done. Father, for all the ways that we have failed, we pray your forgiveness. We worship you, Father, because you are love and you are full of grace and mercy. We trust in your presence we trust in your power. We trust in your love and your grace. Empower us, Father, to continue worshiping you, to continue coming before your throne, lifting each other up, lifting our cares up, and drawing closer to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You know how sometimes you think you know what you're doing, and then you get into doing it, and you're like, uh, I don't like this. That happened this week. So um, we are not actually reading from Luke chapter 11. We are reading from Luke chapter 22. So if you are already in your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 11, because that's what's in the bulletin. My apologies. We are actually in Luke 22. Um, this is one of those things that, you know, six weeks ago probably more like 12 weeks ago when we were uh, getting the, the service sort of planned out. It made sense, but then getting into it here in the last week, it's like, nope, I like this other one better. So we're going to Luke 22. In Luke 22, we read these words. That when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst you. 
For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. And he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So if you remember, um, Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And um, they are in the upper room together eating this, this Passover meal. And he's already washed their feet. Um, in a couple verses, Judas will take the bread and dip it in Jesus' cup, signifying his betrayal. But here in this this middle time, in these verses here of 14 through 20, we hear Jesus giving these, these final words to his disciples. He knows that the cross is coming. He knows that that Uh, that day of torture and pain and beating is just on the horizon. And before that happens, he wants to share one final meal with his disciples. He wants to share with them the good news that as they gather together, that they are instituting a new tradition which exposes a greater reality. That in the future, when they get together and they break bread and they drink wine, that they should remember the body of Jesus which is soon to be broken and the blood of Jesus which represents for them a new covenant. Now, this question of covenant is a big deal in in the Old Testament. You have uh, God's covenant with Adam and Eve, God's covenant with uh, Moses, God's covenant with Abraham, God's covenant with Noah. Like, time and time again, we see God making these covenants with the people. And time and time again, we see the people not holding up their end of the bargain. But every time the people of God break the covenant, God, instead of just casting them aside and giving up on them, he creates something new. He gives them a new opportunity. And in uh, the prophet Jeremiah, um, we see the... the, uh, the foretelling of a final covenant which is to come. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we read that the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. That was the covenant with Moses. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. For those who are gathered there with Jesus, when he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, they know that he is referring to this this coming covenant from the book of Jeremiah. That the covenant that that Jesus is um, the, the instrument of will be a covenant that changes everything. It's going to be one where 
where the, the sins of the people are going to be blotted out for good. It's one where the people will have an opportunity to know God more intimately than ever before. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. At the time, and you know, the reason why they were in Jerusalem for Passover, uh, at the temple they had a sacrificial system where blood was spilt for the sins of the people. Going back to the covenant with Moses, you have this, this system that had been designed. Um, if you want to read more deeply, just start in about Lamentations chapter 13 and go forward. Um, but there was this system designed to, to, uh, to erase the sins of the people, to give the people atonement. And by the time of the prophet Jeremiah, they recognized that that while the people may be sinless in the sight of God, they were still sinning. There were still problems. It wasn't working to completely rid them of sin. It wasn't bringing about the sort of repentance that was necessary. But what the sacrifice of Jesus does as this final atoning sacrifice for us is it not only it not only puts us in right relationship with the Father for a moment, but forever. And it, it not only puts us in, it, it not only changes our legal status before God, but it changes our hearts. It gives us the opportunity to live lives of integrity. It gives us the opportunity to live lives of humility and kindness and generosity. When we come to the table, when we consume the bread and the juice, when we consume the body and the blood, we do it to remind ourselves of this new covenant which we are living into. One where we can do nothing to earn our atonement but the price of our atonement's already been paid we are already in right relationship with the father the new covenant has been established and we are living into that in the here and now so please rise and let's sing together uh, number 405 seek ye first Luke 24, we read these words. 
Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Uh, two of them, these are two disciples. And Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers, they handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up, and they returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. There is something about breaking the bread that helps us to recognize Jesus. Somehow, in these moments, the Holy Spirit shows up in a special way so that we are encouraged and our spirit is strengthened in the knowledge of the resurrection. So we come to the table in part because when we come to the table, our faith is renewed. There is something that happens deep within us at the table that affirms to us the truth that Jesus is risen. So that from our very inner selves, we can cry out, He is Lord. In a world of things that are trying to get our attention, in a world of things that are trying to get our allegiance, in a world of things that are trying to get our support, when we come to the table, we are reminded at the very center of ourselves that Jesus is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. So we come. We come because here at the table we are reminded of this new covenant. One in which God chooses to save us and it's not anything that we can do on our own. But it is a gift that we are given by the Father through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. We come to the table because it affirms deep within us the truth that the tomb is empty, that he is risen. He is risen indeed.
It's interesting to me that as they get to the village, Jesus says, all right, see you, fellas, and we'll keep going. But they invite him to stay. I think there's something instructional there for us. That in the same way as Jesus did not force himself upon the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus doesn't force himself upon us now. We are the agents with the opportunity to invite Jesus into our lives, to invite Jesus into deepening our understanding of that which is holy and that which is good. So this morning, as we come to the table, may we approach with a spirit of invitation, one that has been strengthened in the knowledge that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is risen, that he is Lord, that we live under this new covenant where it's not about our capacity to find a perfect spotless lamb and to slaughter it just right at just the right time with the sun in the right position and all the things working together just perfectly, but instead, it's already been taken care of. The blood of the spotless lamb has been spilt for our sake. And we get to respond by inviting him into our lives ever more fully. Inviting him to transform our hearts and our minds so that we can be everything that God has created us to be. This morning for our communion liturgy, we will um, use the communion liturgy that Christians have been using for millennia. Um, you can go back and find this liturgy being used uh, long before any of us were alive or any of our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. This is one of the things that connects us to the eternal, universal church of Jesus Christ. So friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks 
To you he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the of faith. Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. O oh, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So friends, now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. You will open your cups and take out your... If you need one, uh, raise your hand and, and they will be delivered quickly. Ah, you're okay, Ed. Friends, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and be thankful. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you would please rise for our final hymn.
now may our Lord Jesus Christ go near you to defend you, go before you to guide you, go behind you to forgive you, go above you to bless you, and live within you so you may love one another. He lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and even forevermore. Amen. Thank you.